Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, legendary drummer, speaker, and educator, Sora. And now, Rich Redman. What's up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. Another edition of the Rich Redmond Show coming to you from Music City, USA, Northern California. Our guest is coming from today. I'm so excited about this, Jim. I always say, Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy voiceovers.com. What's up, buddy? How are you? Hey, buddy. How are you? Long time no see. How are you? Are you, how you, are you still practicing your morning radio voice? Uh, always. I don't think I've ever gotten rid of it. <laughs> So right? we we both know this gentleman. We have a, a long time relationship with this gentleman, um, but there never has been a conversation that has happened. It's about to go down. I mean, we're going to spend an hour together and I'm just going to read this right off of here because this is so perfectly laid out. The leaflet from one of his books. He is a world renowned drummer, has toured and recorded with Lenny Kravitz, Bobby Brown, New Edition, Frankie Vellon in the Four Seasons. And he's also an author, a life coach, an ordained minister and a founder of Zorro International Ministries who speaks to audiences worldwide on topics of personal excellence and life purpose. Our friend, Zorro the Drummer. How are you, buddy? Good, Rich. How you guys doing, man? You guys look good there in Nashville. <laughs> Thank you. He's yeah, talking Jeff. to you. No. <laughs> no, no, man. I love the backdrop. So if you guys are just consuming this with your with your ear holes, uh, Mr. Zorro is in front of this beautiful Zoom backdrop of a castle in Germany. What is that all about, Z? It's called it's called the Schweinstein and it's yeah. in, it's in Bavaria and it's surrounded by a beautiful beautiful lake there. I don't know. It's one of the richest most beautiful areas in the world to me. Yeah. It's mountainous. Uh, they filmed a couple of movies there. Also, the movie called The Great Escape with I think Steve McQueen. They filmed some shots of it in that area in Bavaria. Beautiful rolling hills and, and lakes and mountains. And this castle is very famous because if you've ever been to Disneyland, Disneyland models the Cinderella castle after this castle. That's where it's incredible. Disneyland. Yeah. It was made by a, a, a king named Ludwig, L U D W I G, like the drum. I guess he was a madman and he made people build it up at this hill. It's not like it's, it was easy to get the materials up there. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, it's uh, it's just, uh, I've been there a few times. I love it. It's one of my favorite spots. You'll see when you're there, you'll see people hang gliding over the lake and stuff. Wow. And they, they also filmed the movie Chitty Chitty Bang Bang there with Dick Van Dyke and the Buffalo <laughs> Car, which by the way, m most people don't make that equation, but Chitty Chitty Bang Bang was written by Ian Fleming, who wrote all the James Bond novels. Oh, and really? And the movie was produced by Albert Broccoli, who's the man who did all of the James Bond movies. If you look at all the early Bond movies with Sean Connery and Roger Moore, I mean, even to now, uh, Albert R. R. Broccoli is the producer. Well, he produced Chitty Chitty Bang Bang because it was an Ian Fleming novel, and they hired the Sherman Brothers to write all the songs. The Sherman Brothers wrote all of the great Disney catalog, the Mary Poppins, the Small World, just wow. all the great Disney stuff was written by those two brothers. So they wrote all the music for that. Not that anybody was asking about any of this stuff or wanted to know about well, it. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we're getting to... We're, you asked about the, about the picture. I, I always have history with everything. We got some film trivia. You know, I, I always feel like a lot of Ludwigs are, 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 are crazy, forward-thinking individuals. They really... I mean, look at the Ludwig drums push the limit. Uh, yeah. Ludwig van Beethoven push the yeah. limits. You know, yeah. Yeah, and, and like Ludwig. you said, it's, a, it's a, probably a common name over in Germany. It's like uh, like like, like Hans. 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 Yeah. yeah. Like Hans in, in the, <laughs> the Ratzel. <laughs> Hans. Hans I have yeah. friends that are named both those names. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you look great, man. It's great. To, it's yeah. so great to see you. You know, I mean, this is, uh, how, you know, you've got these two books here. I want to just shed the light on this. There's, there's two books. There was a first one that came out around 2011 called The Big Gig, Big Picture Thinking for Success. So it's, it's am I right in saying it's like there's, there's some biopic, biopic uh, elements, and, but it's also a guide, a roadmap to success for creatives that want to find success in the music business. And then your next book that came out in two, 2006. 16 or so soar you were meant to live for so much more i love it it's nine proven keys for unlocking your limitless potential is more of a just straight down the middle like hey motivation type book right self-help i love yeah. them both man 
Well, thanks, man. Well, uh, it's interesting when you mentioned both of those because I had celebrations of both of those books when they came out. I can vividly remember when I received the first copies of each book. I was living in Nashville at the time. Right. And they both arrived, of course, by mail from the publisher. And when I got them, it was one of those things you work on it for years and you you want to savor the moment. So I didn't want to open it right away. I wanted to wait till night. And then my wife made my favorite dinner, which is, uh, well, she, she's an amazing cook. She cooks a million dishes. But one of my favorites is called spicy shrimp linguine. Ooh. And so it's, but the she puts more, if, if it asks for two cloves of garlic, she'll put like 30. So, and then crushed red pepper and a little wine. Ooh. My favorite dish. So I, I literally have pictures of those books on my di- uh, on my uh, on our dining room table with like candles and a whole like celebration when the books came out and I was living in Nashville when both of those books came out so it's just interesting I had I didn't really think about it but the, the first one I wrote the big gig the big gig believe it or not could be traced down 30 years earlier to an article I wrote uh, I used to be in all the fan fan magazines and when i was with new edition which was like a hot group in the 80s they were sort of rejected by the 80s i became a bit of a teen star so i was in all the teen magazines and i had centerfolds in there zorro teen i was black teen of the month white teen of the month latin teen of the month (laughs) afghani teen of the month you know i was in every ethnic magazine there was as a teen of the month and i remember writing an article in one of the magazines at the time it was called and i still have it it was called zorro's show business tips And what it was, was just basically an outline. It was like a three or four page article, pretty in depth. Well, that little outline of my show business tips, because I was getting a lot of fan mail at the time, people asking, how do you make it in the business? And these are not music magazines. These were like fan magazines. Yeah. Teen beat and stuff. Tiger beat. Exactly. So I wrote this article called Zorro Show Business Tips. And you can basically look at that and you can see that that became a template for what became a 40, 440 page book right. on the music industry. And it's not my, it's not my bio. It's not my, I'm sorry. It's not my uh, uh, memoir or autobiography, anything, but there are some of my stories in it. But what it is, is it was really the book I was looking for when I was 18 years old. When I was 18 years old in LA, I scoured every bookstore And I was looking for a book from a musician, a sideman, somebody who had made it as a player about how all this worked. And I looked and looked and searched and I never found one. It was very frustrating. I would find books about the music industry, like, you know, contracts with record companies and ASCAP, but nothing about like from a player. And I find books about bands that made it, but nothing ever from a musician who had made it as a player, which was my dream. And I got very frustrated. And I said, one day when I make it, I'm going to, I'll write a book about it to show people all that. And so basically I had to live it for 30 some years, 40, sure. 40, you know, I had to live it to understand, but, but I, I began writing that book. I mean, years and years and years in advance. And when I was on tour with different people, when, when you know, when we were on the planes and at the rehearsals, I remember uh, rehearsing with Frankie Valley in the four seasons, we would have like four hour rehearsals and three of it was just them doing vocals and me waiting to when, when they want me to play. So sure. for those three hours I had my laptop and I was writing the big gig, yeah. you know, and then I wrote the commandments of R and B drumming series, all the drum books kind of in the same downtime and, you know, traveling on flights. Anyway. So the book was really to help people uh, understand. Um, I, I talk about three forms of success in the book. There is vocational success, spiritual success and personal success. And so to me, when I was young and we were all young, we want to be successful, but then you have to figure out what does that mean? Because success means different things to different people. So you can be vocationally successful, but, but have no success in your personal life, which a lot of musicians have that. that. You can be successful in your spiritual life, meaning you have a relationship with God. You understand your spiritual purpose but then you have no vocational success. You're not using your gift and you haven't exercised it. So I kind of broke it down to life is only complete when you're sort of succeeding in all three of those areas, because if you're not, you always feel empty. You always feel like something's missing. I'm rich and famous, but I don't have a family. I'm, I have a spiritual purpose, but I'm not using my gift of talents. I get along great with people, but I've never found my joy in my profession. So I just frame it around that. And then it's all these, I can't remember how many chapters you've got the book in front of you, but it's a lot of yeah, chapters. Yeah. And everything is the art of something. It's the art of strategy, the art of practicing, the art of touring, the art of recording, the art of marketing. You know, every, there's an art to everything. And I remember 
every chapter is that. And then I used a song name, I think for the, yeah, for each thing, like, uh, against all odds that uh, you would yeah, come yeah. up with cool song titles. Yeah. Because it was kind of, it helps tell the story. And then the, the other thing is there's thousands of quotes in all of my books. Cause I've always loved the power of words. And so there's tons and tons of motivational quotes, just about every page. I love that. that. Yeah. That coincides with the thought of what I'm teaching. But anyway, that's how the big gig came about. And, uh, and then soar uh, was a, a, a life book that would be more spiritual by nature that because a lot of people really don't understand like what their purpose on the planet is. And so you can still be, you know, succeeding in your vocation and still feel empty because you don't understand why you're here and what's the point of all of it. And so uh, SOAR is, is a book to really teach you n- nine life principles on number one, how you unlock your limitless potential, because I believe that everybody listening and everybody in the world was created by God with a, an unlimited uh, potential to excel, but it's within a specific area, the area you were given. We cannot excel at everything because we don't have the gifting for everything. But whatever God gave us, which we didn't get to pick, like you and I are drummers, we didn't pick drumming, we had the drumming gift. We just followed that intuitive thing. But like we couldn't make ourselves have rhythmic talent, just like I couldn't make myself be a singer right now if I don't have singing talent, or I couldn't yeah. make myself have any talent. But so I kind of have this uh, philosophy that God's equipped everybody with a talent. Now, not everyone has discovered it, not everyone has done anything with it, and some people have rejected what they have because they want something else. Uh-huh. It, Mark Twain put it this way. He said, most of us are anxious to be praised for the one gift that we do not possess rather than the 15 that we do. Um, So we're always wanting to be something that we're not, and then we're negating the things that we have. But if you don't negate what you have in that arena, if you discover what your gifting is, you have the uh, potential to to soar and to be unlimited in your uh, your scope of what you could do with it. So to me, that's the, the goal of your life is to first discover what that is. And so the book's about really how you discover your gift, then how you develop your gift, because you're accountable to develop what God gave you. You can't just sit and squander it. Uh, you've developed your gift. You work very, very hard on your drumming. So you're a perfect example of that, and Jim is. So so the, the way that the, the Bible puts it is that God, God already gave us the gift, so that was his gift to us. Our gift is developing it and turning it into something and serving humanity with it in some kind of way. So our, uh, you know, and we're, we're accountable for that because he's, you know, he's not going to do the practicing for you. He's not. So everything that we receive in life, we receive in the form of a seed. So a seed is like a tree in a, in a, in a, in a, in a garden, you know? Yes. Everything comes as a seed, but it has to be planted. It has to be nurtured. It has to be watered. It has to be fertilized. And if you do all those things and protect the crop, it will grow into something magnificent. But never at any point can you ever say that you created the seed. Nobody created the tree. Nobody created the fruits. Nobody created the vegetables. You just simply abide by the principles of sowing and reaping. You go, hey, there's a seed here. I put it in the ground. If I do this, it's going to grow. Yeah. And so our talents are pretty much like that. We have this unlimited potential to soar. And then the last part of it is so you, you discover, you develop. Then the last part of it is the purpose is you deploy it. You must deploy your gifting in order for you to feel fulfilled, and you must serve people with it. Because if your life is a journey of self, you will self-destruct and you will self-implode because you were never meant to serve just yourself, and it's right. unsatisfying. So you, you, you find your satisfaction when you're giving your life to people and you're, and you're helping people, and you're, you're making the world better with through your gift by serving people. And that's all I've done as a drummer is I've served other people people right. and i you know and you do the same thing so yeah. when you do that there's a sense of satisfaction and and contentment that you get because if your journey is just self oriented i have never met a self centered person who was happy there are no selfish people that are happy they don't exist your happiness is found when you're giving your life away so really there's only two ways to live your life you live your life you live a life of self or a life of service sure. and that's it. And so I just found the way to serve. And then it really doesn't, uh, people always ask me, you know, like, you know, why did you do, why did you write a book or why do you speak or why do you do? I never did anything in my life. I never pursued anything other than what I was compelled to do. 
Sure. I never wrote a drum book to go, oh, let me fill a niche in the market. Let me see what books haven't been written. I never did anything like that. I only did what I was compelled to do, and I would have written all my books if nobody read them but me. <laughs> Yeah, I remember as a young man, like transcribing licks off the radio and compiling them on staff paper and little binders. And it's like, I think that we were just, we, we were born to do this, you know, it's, it's like, but you didn't reject anything. You fully embraced your God given talents and you, and you developed it. And what's so sad as I know we've experienced this as educators and as mentors is someone who has an incredible amount of raw talent, but is so lazy. They choose not to hone it, to water it, to nurture it. And they get passed up by the people that have less talent, but are yeah. hard workers. And we see it every day. That would be the personal side of things, right? Say again? That would be the personal side of things, it would seem. Instead of, uh, yeah, well, like well, basically, we're all, you know, we're all accountable <clears throat> to develop our own gifting. So no one's going to practice for you. It all really comes down to uh, desire. Desire is the key to everything. And you have to muster up desire for yourself. You might be the most talented person in the world, but if you're apathetic and lazy and indifferent, you're right. People can go further on less talent than people, you know, who have a lot of talent who've never, because it takes, it takes so much more. It, it takes, it takes an attitude. It takes an attitude of, of work and a work ethic. And, you know, I grew up with uh, a single immigrant mother who raised seven children alone. Uh, I've, I've been working as long as I can remember being alive since I was six years old on the streets of Compton, California. So uh, when I grew up, I used to feel envious of other people who had money or who had, parents, stable parents or successful people. But now when I look back on my life, I'm the most grateful person in the world because all of that, um, all of that oppression and poverty and the diff different things that I experienced that put inside of me, you know, chutzpah and determination yeah. and, and a wherewithal that you only get through hard circumstances. If your life is too cushy and easy, not always, but generally you you don't develop that do or die mentality and that fighter spirit. It's just it, things come too easy. And yes. And uh, so I think, you know, everyone is different. You, you, you can have five kids grow up in a super rich family and three of them will be lazy and two of them will be go getters. And who yeah. knows, you know, but I do know that um, there's only one way to uh, to there's only two ways to respond when you're in, in adversity. You either just crumble and get crushed or you become stronger as a result of it. You know, and a lot what of that determines uh, who you're around. Sure. What did Rocky Balboa say about it? You know, life is going to knock you down and keep you there if you let it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's very true. Very yeah. true. <clears throat> It's how you, how you respond to those circumstances and how you keep getting up that defines right. you, you know, because, you know, I tell her like, man, I wanted to play the Hollywood Bowl when I was 21 years old, but I played the Hollywood Bowl when I was 41. And that's 20 years of rejection and dusting myself off and trying to find a vehicle. That vehicle was a young singer songwriter who saw something in me and together we were able to build something. That's a lot of patience. That's a lot of perseverance. That's a lot of desire. That's having a focus and just not stopping. Wow. Um, you know, but what's interesting is, is that idea of having a balance of spiritual, personal, and professional. And I think very few creatives have that. I know that you've pulled it off. I know the gym's pulled it off. You know, I've got a little bit of a checkered past. It's hard. It's hard when you're, but, but you, you know, if, you're, you're, you're traveling 300, you know, 40 days a year. That's yeah. hard on a personal life. But I mean, it's, it may seem like I have it all together, but it really didn't come together for me till you know, maybe five, 10 years ago, up until yeah. then. And a lot of people don't know this about me. I've had a very troubled um, level of confidence and self image, probably from 15 to 30 years old. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. That's, that's, that's uh, you know, I mean, <clears throat> so many people that are, are that way and yeah, it, it is, it is a hard balance in life to, yeah. to balance all those things. But I have seen a lot of musicians succeed at music or artists or actors and people in, you know, high places. And I've seen them succeed, but then at the expense of no personal life. Like I used to travel with right. Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, who was the fourth richest guy in the world. Right. He started Microsoft with Bill Gates. He owned the Seahawks and the Portland Trailblazers and most of Amazon when it first started. And a super nice guy. And, and, uh, when I met him and traveled with him, I 
I, it's hard. It's, it's hard to believe that you could be sad for the richest guy in the world, but I was very sad for him because I thought, here's a guy that on paper has everything that the world clamors after. I mean, he literally, his yacht was $240 million. It was the most expensive privately owned yacht in the world. He had a recording studio in the yacht, a movie theater, 12 Navy SEALs, 60 man crew, a a massage parlor, the best, the best chefs in the world, a submarine, another yacht inside the yacht. I mean, it was, that's the highest you could go in the world, right? A partridge in a pear tree. Yeah, a total and a partridge in a pear tree. And a, and a, and a, <laughs> well, Z, what did you notice about him? What did you notice? Well, that we, well, well here's, here's what I noticed. The man wasn't married, and he didn't have a family. He had no heirs. He had no children. Yeah. He was surrounded by all these people that were afraid to walk left or right in front of him. When you're that wealthy, you know, the whole world kisses your behind. No one tells you the truth and you don't know if anybody likes you for who you are. Uh-huh. And, you know, I knew that he had at one point uh, dated Monica Sellis, the tennis player and was engaged to her. But when I met him, it was this really nice man who was just so lonely. And you just look at that and you go, you can have everything. It seems like everything and still have nothing that really matters in the end, because in the end, uh, you know, in, in being a spiritual person and a Christian person who's always curious about those things, I've read a lot of books about people in their dying day. So I read this book by a hospice nurse, and, and it was it was all her stories of all the her clients who died in front of her, and it was so you, that's very sobering when you read about fifty people and what their last thoughts were, which while she was with them. And what you realize is that nobody at the end of their life is going, gee, I wish I had more gold records, or gee, I wish I had more buildings named after me, or gee, I wish I would have gotten the Oscar. No one is thinking about that. What they're thinking about is, gee, I wish I would have loved people more. Gee, I wish I would have done something nice for humanity. Gee, I wish I would have forgiven my dad or my mom or my ex-wife. Like, it always goes to the personal things it never goes to the profession. It never goes to the money. It never goes to the, it always goes, the regrets are always personal ones. And you go, you know what? I, I'm sure I could be a better drummer than I am today. Whatever I've, whatever I've accomplished, I'm sure I could have accomplished more if I was willing to sacrifice my family in the midst of it, you know, because there's only so many hours a man or a woman has in their life. Right. And so this is what I've learned about life. Everybody, from Paul Allen or Bill Gates on down, everybody only has 24 hours a day to manage your life. Nobody gets more than 24 hours a day, and nobody gets more than one body to do life in. And so wealthy people, if they could if they could do it, they would buy another body and say, uh, uh, you work out for me, and then that body will be healthy, and you eat the right stuff. But we only get one body, rich or poor, and you only get 24 hours a day, rich or poor. That's where the playing field is equal. Now it's about how you manage that. And the Bible calls that stewardship. Stewardship is this concept that everything belongs to the king. The king is God. Everything belongs to God. Your life belongs to him. He just gave it to you on loan like a landlord. But one day you will have to answer to the king and show him how you've stewarded the property. So the property Mm -hmm. is you, your life, your time, your family, your friends, your talent, when you die, it all goes, right? But it's it's all it's about stewarding it. So I realized at a certain point, I'm just a landlord of what I have. I don't own anything, but I'm just going to try to be a really good landlord. So when the master comes back, I can say, I've taken good care of your property. And I personally, and every, every artist is different. I wanted to have a family that was very important to me only because I grew up fatherless. I grew up with the father who abandoned me, who said I was dead. And, uh, and so I grew up with a lot of hurt in that way. So one of my goals besides a drummer was to one day become a great father, to become a family man, to make up for what I didn't have. And, and I did that. But all that to say, I could have toured with many more people than I did. I could have done way more than I've done. But I, I, I tried to balance everything and go, there's always an exchange for something. And so for me, because of because of what I didn't have as a child, and because I wanted to become the kind of husband my mother never found, those were also very strong goals for me. And so I've been married now for 25 years. Now my son is 21 and in college, and uh, he went to Pepperdine for uh, his first year, and now he's nice. at a school on the East Coast. I got a daughter who's 19 who's in college, and you know, 
those years went by and now they're grown up. They're not fully grown and they're still finding their way in life. But like, if I would have just done nothing but constantly stay on the road all those years, I would have missed out on this beautiful. So there's always an exchange, but that's just the path I took. I'm not knocking anybody who didn't, but I'm just saying that in the end, this is all really hard. It's really hard to balance uh, this combination of, of, of a spiritual life with a professional life and a personal life because they all intertwine. They're all part of life. There's no, even people who say they're not spiritual, everybody, everybody in this, in this world believes in something and even not believing something is believing in something. So we all have a faith. We all, it takes an, it takes faith to be an atheist. It takes faith to be a Christian. It takes faith to be a Buddhist. It takes faith to be a drummer. It takes faith to be a person walking on the street every day. When yeah. People tell me, how do you have so much faith? I go, look, now you have faith too. Faith is like a muscle in the fact that we all have muscles, but we must work and develop muscles if you want them to be strong. So yeah. faith is a spiritual muscle, but it is one that every human being has because you can't, like you go on the road with Jason Aldean. You don't know that he's going to pay you. In faith, you believe at the end of the week you're going to get paid. When you get on a flight, you don't know that it's going to take off. You're hoping that it does. In faith, you believe it's going to, but you have no proof that it's going to. You can't exist for 30 seconds in this world without exercising faith. You put faith in me today that at 3 o'clock I'd I'd jump on the Zoom call because I said I would, but I could have not. (laughs) So we all have faith. It's just where, where we place it. And even an atheist has to have an enormous amount of faith to believe in what he believes or what she believes in. All this is by accident and completely nothing. That yeah. takes a lot of faith to believe that. It takes a lot more faith than the, uh, than the other. Well, it does, because you have to believe there's no purpose, there's no order, there's no... But yet, we have all these divine things about human beings, like, you know, the divine expression of love, of kindness, of forgiveness, the joy of creating. You know, mankind has has this incredible gift to where if he thinks up something and dreams up something, he can make it a reality. You know, that that's that's divinity, man. That's like a taste of God in us. You know, no I, I just you, yeah, I, with with all with Shakespeare and romance and and the and just the beauty in the world, it seems to me absolutely crazy to think that some people can't believe in anything besides them, like a, a higher version of them. I mean, you can't even work uh, AA. You can't even be, be a, a recovered alcoholic without believing in something other absolutely. than yourself. Uh, that's absolutely right, because they all have to go to a higher power and surrender. I've spoken at those things. Uh, I speak at Celebrate Recovery, yeah. which is uh, which is an AA type of thing, you know, at churches and stuff. And th- those are one of the principles, you know, surrender to a higher power. Yes. Different people call it different things. But intuitively, I believe we all know there's a God intuitively yeah. in- inside your heart of hearts. Because when people are in a war, in the middle of a war, People are crying out to God. <laughs> when when you see when you're in a foxhole with yeah, bombs yeah. going on around yeah, you, you're going, Lord, you know. Watch the movie. Uh, you've probably seen it already, but Unbroken about uh, Louis Zamperini. But he was, you know, his plane went down in World War II and he landed in the ocean, and him and three other dudes were stuck on a dinghy for like like a month. One died, and but he made a deal with God while he was out there. I mean, these guys these guys killed a shark with their hands and aid it to survive like yeah. in most incredible survival story so he survives this and then some storm comes that's going to take him out and he made a promise to god he goes lord if you if you spare my life i will spend the rest of my life and serve you i mean he just called out and he made it and spared his life so then so then he thinks he's made it he, they get discovered, they get rescued, but then it's it's the it's the uh, Japanese people that discover them. Now they go into a torture camp for about yeah. I can't remember how many years where they get tortured by the worst people in the world and just brutal. But he still survives and makes it, and he became this amazing, amazing man and became this Christian who preached the gospel the rest of his life. And he went through a lot of hard times after that, but he made it, I think into his nineties. And then they made the movie about him and the book came out much earlier. But so all that to say that, you know, everything in life is a journey of faith to be, to become Mm -hmm. a drummer and to, to become a good person, to become a husband, to, to do anything is going to require faith. You, you, we, we put faith in each other, you know, like you put faith in your friend, 
Jason Aldean. I put faith in my friend Lenny Kravitz and Bobby Brown. And you, you place bets on people and you go, I, I think that guy is going to be a friend. I think he's going to make it. I believe in him. And yes. then he believes in me as a drummer, you know, and mm. then together, you know, if you're lucky, together you live out this dream together but i've always placed faith in friendships because my life has been formed by the friendships i've formed that's made me who i am yeah i mean our our industry is not monster.com and resumes it's all personal relationships and people championing each other and having the faith that you're going to show up and get behind those tubs and whether you have the flu or diarrhea you're gonna kick butt Yeah. You know, they put that kind of faith in us and we have such an important job. I mean, the, what we have to do with the groove and the dynamics and the physicality, it's a massive responsibility. And, and I think we do it with a smile on our face. Let me ask you this, um, with your speaking, you're so articulate and you have so many great things to share. Tell us about San Quentin. That must have been a highlight for you. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I was asked to minister at San Quentin. So that's pretty, pretty heavy. From- yeah. From 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 playing the biggest stages of the world, the biggest television shows in the world, to uh, traveling on the octopus, to 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 growing up in Compton. Now, uh, you know, so I literally I literally can say I've seen the top and the bottom. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? the best that humanity has to offer, the worst. But what was interesting was uh, I went in there, and I and, and of course it's a maximum security prison, and it's very very intimidating and very very scary because you're dealing with some of the most hard criminals in the world and then it doesn't help when just before you go in they tell you like well these guys can smell if you're fearful and these guys can you know so if they see fear all over you you're done you know what i mean so that that, 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 this though going into something like that do you have the faith of daniel I yeah, that's have, kind of that scenario. I always have the faith of Daniel or I wouldn't yeah. be doing it. Uh, you know, um, God <clears throat> doesn't uh, uh, call, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. Mm. He equips the called. So I've always known I've been called. And so I've always had a lot of courage. And so even as a kid, so if I feel like I'm supposed to do something and I feel like God's speaking that to me, even if I feel unqualified, that I don't have any knowledge to do that. Like, for instance, my books. I barely graduated high school. I never took writing classes. I never studied writing. But God called me to be a writer when I was a kid. When I was about 11 years old, we had moved from Compton. And we had a drastic life change from Compton to move to the rural woods of Grants Pass, Oregon. That, that's like moving from the set of Sanford and Son to the set of Little House on the Prairie. There <laughs> couldn't be any more polar extreme than that. But anyway, at, at that time, I began, I couldn't afford to go camping and I wanted to go really bad because I couldn't afford to go. I just decided I was going to write a camping book. And I checked out every book in the library about camping. And I began writing a camping book at 11. I had the whole manuscript by hand. And so God called me to be a writer, even though I didn't feel qualified. I didn't know at that time, later I'd write books. Even in high school, I didn't know I'd write books. But in other words, and this is most people that don't understand, like, if God calls you to do something, he's going to equip you if you have the courage to just step out in faith and do the first thing. The first thing is to believe that you can do it and that you that you're called to do it. So I knew that God had called me to speak in places like that, and so I figured I will rise up to the occasion even though I might be frightened or I might not be prepared, but I can't tell you how amazing it went. I mean, I went in there and I played I, I played drums. I had grown hardened criminals come up to me afterwards weeping and asking me mm. to pray for them and because of what I played and what I said, you know, and I just went in there and I was just real. I was, I, I, you know, I was just totally, I'm not going to be phony. I'm not going to be, I'm just going to share with you what Christ has done in my life. And I'm going to, I'm going to give you a message of hope, no matter what you've gone through or what you, where you've been. And I'm going to tell you my story so you'll know what I've come through and why I'm this way. And it, it went incredibly well. I mean, you know, and then I got, I got asked to do, you know, a few other uh, major prisons as well. You know, then I got asked to do uh, Folsom prison, you know, and then the Folsom women's prison and all that. So uh, to me, I'm, I'm comfortable in any, in any setting that you throw me in because uh, here's what I, here's how I go about life. 
I go about my father's business. The father is the Lord himself, Jesus Christ. So what is his business? His business is people and people are everywhere. So people are, people are backstage at big Hollywood parties and Oscars and Grammys. And they're also in prison and they're also in underprivileged cities and underprivileged ghettos and their people are everywhere. So I just go, you know, how can I use my life to be a blessing to people? Sometimes it's the drumming. Sometimes it's the speaking. Sometimes it's the teaching. Sometimes sure. it's the ministering. Sometimes it's just the hanging, but the goal is the same with all of it. Love on people, let them feel my genuine love and let them feel the love of God through me because God in a way is like an alien who's looking for a host home. The host is the people who receive him and let him come alive in them. And then he overtakes you so that everywhere you go, people are feeling his presence in the drumming, in the speaking, in the teaching, in the laughter, in the hanging, because you're just an emissary. You're just a light for him. And that's all you are. You're, and, and so I'm, I am not uh, the smartest guy in the world. I'm not the most talented guy in the world. What I am is I'm a dude who has childlike faith. And I believe that everything is possible. I believe that I can write. I'm working on my memoir right now, which Great. I've been working 10 years and I should be done with that this year. It's the hardest thing I've ever undertaken harder than any other kind of writing. Everyone says that. Yeah. Yeah. It's just incredibly hard. I've been studying the craft for 10 years, but, but, but God gave me visions of it. God gave me visions of the memoir, the visions of the memoir as a movie about my life, the vision of a Netflix series about my life and my family. Nice. This is a very compelling story, but this is the difference between me and lots of people is, Lots of people get visions and dreams, but then they don't believe them, and they don't believe that they're possible. Sure. Uh, I believe that they're all—they all for me—they all come from the Lord, and there's a purpose in them. It's not just oh, let me have a book about me so I can show people how fabulous I am. No, the book will inspire you to live your dream by me showing you how I lived mine. It's not for me, uh, you know. If if I keep everything that I have to myself, all the love that I have or all the wisdom or knowledge or experience that I have, then it dies with me. But what I give away to other people will live through eternity. Because you and I know, as people who motivate and educate people, when you deposit something in somebody, it can never be undeposited. You, know, you can never undeposit encouragement or uh, you know uh, inspiration into people. So, so to me, every, I, I always think about everything in light of eternity. What I'm doing now, all the people I'm affecting with my platform, with what I have, we can only affect people with what we have. You know, if you're a carpenter, it's going to be doing carpentry. I remember once somebody asked me, some real religious, judgmental, pious Christian person asked me, like, if you're a Christian. How can you play with all those secular artists, you know, all those, you know, like, and, and I said, okay, I said, uh, fair question. I said, what do you do? Oh, I'm a plumber. Okay. Are you a Christian? Yeah. So do you only fix Christian toilets? Do you only fix Christian when, when or do you just go to when everybody's got, when everybody's got a toilet problem, you just go to whatever house calls you. Right. So that's what I do. Whoever that, was a, calls, that was a good zinger. <laughs> it well, I mean, it's, it, but it's it's what you're talking about is okay do you remember when jesus only went to the same people who believed the way he did right well okay. it's, it, no he didn't right exactly exactly and the thing is a lot of times you know you have to i mean the bible says jesus came for that which was lost he came for the lost not those that already know him so we are but i'm not i'm a christian person but i'm not a religious person I actually, I always, I always ask people, why did Jesus come to earth? And, they, and it always stumps them. And it's always toward in this conversation he has with Pilate. He tells him exactly. He says, you know, I've come to bear witness to the truth. There you go. And, and that's why, like, and, and he said that I am the, truth, the way and the life, you know, and he says, I only do as my father does. So I kind of see everything I do as I'm in my father's business. And what is my father's business? People. People are his business. The way that he equipped me to, to uh, the way that he called me and equipped me is I'm going to put you in a business where you're going to excel in these areas or you have the potential to excel in these areas, but I've already pre-gifted you. I pre-gifted you as a communicator, as a writer, as a speaker, as a drummer, but now it's up to you what you do with it and it's up to you how you use it to serve me. But I always look at everything as I'm, if I'm blessing somebody else, I'm serving my father because think of it like, um, 
you know, you're all, you all had fathers or mothers, right? I mean, why do most people have children? Most people have children to have a relationship with them, to have fellowship with them. And so why did God create man to have fellowship with them? What pleases me as a father is when people love on my children, when they do something nice for my kids, you, you've won my heart. What pleases God when we do something nice for his children, which is our brother mankind, male or female. When we are loving and kind to each other, we are pleasing the heart of the Father, just like a parent would be pleased if somebody is kind and showing kindness and grace and love and mercy to their children. It's all so simple. See, the whole thing is super simple. Sure. So I would imagine that this day and age, the, the Father's not very pleased. Well, uh, let's say, you know, mankind <laughs> always disappoints God because we have this yeah. sinful nature. But It's just at a height right now. Well, yeah, yeah but it, it, not any more than if you look at throughout history when mankind did right. horrible Nothing things. Nothing new under the sun. Nothing. It's just, it's just different stuff. Right. But, it, but here's the thing, and this is why I always tell people, it's like, if you think man is inherently good, just look at the world. You have all of history to show you that man's heart is deceitfully wicked. And, only, and here's the thing, is that you're using the term good, which, you know, a lot of people, well, he's a good person. Well, what is a good person? And these are, I've been taking my kids out to breakfast once a week, uh, every Tuesday morning. And it's always my oldest where we have these really deep conversations um, about spirituality, the world, politics, all that stuff. And she started throwing around the terms of, you know, good people. I said, okay, well, good is a, is a subjective term. Okay. If you want to look at what happened Let's take, for example, 9-11. <clears throat> Do you realize that there are people in the world that thought that was a good event? And she goes, really? I said, yeah. The people that were cheering in the streets when it happened, America finally got a black eye. All right. And I said, so what is good? Who defines it? You need to figure that out. I can tell you, but you got to feel it. You got to understand that God defined what is good. That he is the arbiter of good and evil. Totally. Well, yeah. we, we live in a world where both of those have always existed. And right. so it, it's, it's important that it's important that we just try to be the light of love and grace and represent, you know, represent Christ in a way that is loving, kind, but also speak, speaking the truth as well. Sure. Uh, and truth. make sure you do it on Facebook all the time. <laughs> The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to musiciansmortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Bruce Klein, NMLS, number 1465948. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS, number 39179. NMLS, consumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. On these kind of shows where I know I'm free to talk about what whatever Rich asks me and he knows my heart, I do. But I don't. I don't post anything. Uh, I don't post anything political on Facebook. No, I, I post it's spiritual pointless. things that are. You know, here's the thing: you're not going to convince somebody uh, on your point of view, whatever it is, and, and just arguing about it isn't isn't going to change anybody. Okay. They still believe what they believe. Everybody is passionate about what they believe. Sure. I try to I try to answer to a bigger calling. My kingdom is not who's sitting at the throne of the White House. Rulers come and go. Rulers come and rulers die. 
and kingdoms come and go, the earth. Uh, I try to put my sights on a higher kingdom, which is the kingdom of God, because in the end, that's the one I'll be answering to. I won't be answering to who was president, who was 46, who was 45, 44, 43, 21. Those people will be gone. I'll be answering to the one who created me. And so right. I, don't, I don't get too wrapped up into who's sitting on the throne uh, of the government because all governments in one way or another are corrupt by the nature of what they are. Sure, because they're people human. With power, but they're people with power who mm-hmm. decide to overlord their will over other people with no power. Churches That's are corrupt. True. Yeah, and the whole mankind is corrupt, you know. Right. But that's why, you know, the only, to me, our only hope is to surrender our heart to Christ, so we can take on more of that Christ-like nature uh, than the flesh, because the flesh is just self-centered. It's just corrupt. It's it's only things of itself. When you give your heart to Christ, you begin this transformative process to where you hopefully over time become less and less uh, operating in the flesh and more and more operating in the spirit. The you soul. Perfection. You know, because you're still a human, but you hopefully, if you were to receive Christ today, hopefully in five years, I could see there's some progress in your life where I could say, he used to be like that, but now he's more like that. Right. He's mm. really bitter and angry, but now he's just more kind and graceful. There has to be some sort of transformation to make it real, or it's just lip service. But anyway, let's get on to some musical. Well, things. yeah, I mean, it's a high, it's a high, high calling to answer to music, and music speaks to the soul. And every great, from the Greeks to the Romans, every philosopher had their thought process on on music. And so, for you, you're a young man in Compton, California, and you are listening to your older brother's record collection, soul music. Is that how it starts for you? Like, what was? Do you remember as far back as possible? where that spark came from. Yeah, I, I can remember. Uh, first of all, I, I grew up with six other siblings, and uh, my mother was a very artistic person. She used to, in Mex- where she's from, Mexico City, she was a, a, a struggling actress to be in the movies, so she was in a few different films. Wow. She absolutely loved music. She loved American jazz music. She loved all kinds of music. And so in my household, I grew up with just constant music playing everybody in, of my siblings listened to something different my sister was a rock and roller listened to all of the you know jimmy hendrix led zeppelin the doors eric burden and the animals all the 60s stuff then my brothers loved soul music and james brown and gospel music and my mother loved frank sinatra and nat king cole and big band and so basically i was hearing music constantly in my household that was that we were very impoverished but we were very rich in music. Music was always there. The very first concert I went to, I was seven years old, and a neighbor, a, a, a neighbor lady friend of my mother's who had a soft heart for her because she saw her raising all these kids alone, and she had a little bit of means. Uh, when I was seven, she paid for me to go see The Temptations and Diana Ross and The Supremes in concert at the Long Beach Municipal Auditorium. And I remember leaving there going, like just because I love Motown and I love soul music and, and, you know, and I grew up mostly in 90, 95% black community. So obviously lots of soul and R and B music in my neighborhood. And so that stuff just permeated my soul long before I knew I was going to be a drummer. It was just in me, that funky music. And then when I saw that concert, I got so inspired that I, the next day I made a ghetto drum set. I made it out of, uh, Tupperware containers, uh, almond roca cans, Folgers coffee cans from the trash, wooden salad spoons. I put them in my red radio flyer wagon. I walked a mile out to Compton Boulevard, turned on my transistor radio, 1150 on the AM dial, Wolfman Jack, the the, the uh, R&B station, and I put the radio on, and I just hit the stuff with wow. my hands on the street corner, and people would throw coins in there, and I was like, this is cool. I didn't even really know what I was doing. I just, I just, again, I was compelled to do it out on the street. What was the first real drum set? Did you pick up like a used kit in a pawn shop or what? How did that? That's a good question. So, so that's at like the age of six or seven where I'm playing with my hands on the street in Compton. Now we fast forward to when we moved up to Oregon and it's the fifth grade and I want to enter a talent show. Now my mother just, uh, just prior to that talent show for Christmas, My mother bought me and surprised me on Christmas morning with a $9.99 Mickey Mouse drum set. Literally Mickey Mm -hmm. on the bass drum cover from Sears, paper heads, 
it's paper really heads. A, it's really a toy. Yeah, it's yeah. The, the paper heads were not much thicker than construction paper. Yes, you know, what I mean? it's oh not like gosh. a real head. But for you know, that's all she could afford. It was nine dollars ninety nine cents. Unfortunately, I destroyed it by Christmas afternoon yeah. because it was just a toy. But yeah. something about that connecting to those little sticks and hitting the little splash symbol and all that. Not long ago, again, when I lived in Nashville, my brother located the original kit, the, the type of kit on eBay and got it for me. So I have in my office now the actual exact model of the kit. It's not the kit I had because I destroyed it, but it's the one from the Sears catalog. <laughs> wow. In Did you put I pictures have, of it up? Oh, I have, I have it in my, I, I can, I can send you guys pictures. I have it in my, uh, in my mm. office as a, a as a, a remembrance of where I started. That so, could be a great uh, picture to promote the episode. That would be like, just, uh, you know, that'd be hilarious. Okay. Instagrammable. I, I'll send you some thoughts because I got some pictures of that. Amazing. So, uh, so I started with that then, and then that got destroyed. So in that spring of that year, I heard they were having a talent show at school. And I wanted to be in it, but I didn't know what I would do because I didn't really play the drums. I didn't play anything. I just wanted to play the drums. So there was a band looking for a drummer. And I just said, I'm a drummer. And I just I had a bunch of chutzpah and said, I'm a drummer. They're like, you got some drums? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I got drums. And so then the first day at the rehearsal, I don't have any drums. Oh, and no. so they asked me, well, where, where, where are your drums at? I'm like, well, they're in the shop right now. They're getting fixed. But I'll just play on the back of the, 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 the chair here with my hands, you know, I'll just keep time with the hands. And they looked all disappointed. And I was just banging the rhythms behind on the hand. And then uh. and the next rehearsal comes and they're like, well, where's your drum set? I'm like, well, there's some parts that were coming from Taiwan and they're not in yet, but I'll just keep playing with my hands. So I knew that the night of the talent show, I'm not going to suddenly have a set of drums. <laughs> so I told my big brother, I said, I'm in big trouble. I said, I told him that I'm a drummer, but I don't have a drum set. What are we going to do? And, and he got creative and he thought about it. He's like, come with me. Let's get in the car. And we went and drive around town looking for different things. We went to an appliance store and we found a big empty appliance box at the appliance store. We put it in the trunk, stayed up all night, and we painted a drum set on the front of the, of the appliance box to look like drums, like from the Sears catalog with sparkles on it and a symbol. I mean, so in other words, imagine just a washer dryer box sideways and you're just going to paint a drum set on the front of it. And then we hauled that up on stage and they were like, where's your drums? And I'm like, my mom went down there to pick them up, but they closed early, you know? So, so I played, and I'll never forget because I was just teaching a lesson yes today, actually this morning, and I was teaching a kid how to play Spain, and he Spotified Spain, you know, different versions, and then one came up was I've I've never been to Spain, which is the version by Elvis Presley he covered from Three Dog Night. Well, I said I said this is crazy that we're looking at the song. I said because that's the very first song I ever played on the box at the talent show was a, a cover version that Elvis did of I, I've never been to Spain. Oh my God. And, I thought you were talking about the chicory version of <laughs> No, right. right. I was thinking <laughs> that, but when we were Spotifying, he put the word Spain and there's a bunch of different Spains come up. Right. Yeah. So I've never been to Spain by Elvis comes up, which is a three night, three dog night cover. Right. So that was the tune we played and I played it on the box. Now, when every, when all the kids were playing, they were all disappointed that, you know, they're looking at me like this kid's just playing a box and they give me like a little bongo solo on the box. But when I, when I was playing on the box, man, I saw like 2 million people in my mind's eye. I was like, I could see it. They were like bummed because there's like 30 kids in the audience and it's mostly mothers and brothers and sisters. But that's how I literally started. Now I would no, So now another epiphany happened and, and this is a beautiful story. So, at that age, my mother signed me up for the Big Brother, Big Sister program. Yeah. Uh, and I, I was a little brother in the program. And so you have a family uh, who sort of adopts you to become your big brother. Well, in my case, it was very interesting. It was a big brother and a big sister because normally you just get a big brother. But this particular family, they took on me, my younger brother, and my younger sister. So they became our big brother, big sister. So one day when I'm 12, you know, their real son – was a professional drummer who was probably around 21 at the time. And he was in a rock band with a cool big truck and the Joe diamond and the something, you know, and <laughs> that's the name of the group. And it was totally seventies. And I was like, wow, that's cool. And one day he had his drum set set up in the living room. Now only recently before they passed and I, I remained friends with them for like 40, 40 some years. 
they found some Super 8 footage and they sent it to me. They said, we want you to have this. It was me noodling on that drum set of their kid. So it's the first footage I have of me ever hitting real drums. I'm not a drummer yet. I'm not playing, but I'm just banging on them. I'm holding the sticks all like Buddy Rich, like two hands left, like, like a left hand. Two I don't traditional know grips, yeah. Yeah, two traditional grips. And I'm just hitting it, but it's like this super, it's like a prophetic thing. Now, another thing I'll tell you that's funny in this story, when my father abandoned me at six months, he left, took the family car and left us for dead, wow. moved back to where he was from in Chicago, told everyone that I had died in childbirth. But the only thing he left me, and I have a picture of it, he left me his set of bongos. And there's a picture of me at about 18 months with bongos beneath my infant feet. And that was the only thing he left me. Wow. And so that's like a prophetic sign. That's very profound. And that, of, yeah. of things mm. to come. You know, that's the only that's the only inheritance I had from this man was a set of bongos. And then, you know, and then we and then and then we do the we do the talent show, and then I do the big brother, big sister thing, and I got footage of me playing the drums, but I wouldn't get a drum set till I was sixteen. I was almost out of uh, uh I was almost out of my sophomore year, and I bought a drum set from a kid at school for a hundred dollars of my own money, and that's how I started. And then, but I got discovered in the band room. My career started because I was a janitor at my own high school. And my part, the end of my two hour janitor job was to clean the band room. And I would clean the band room for the last 30 minutes, vacuum it, put the music stands away, put the instruments away. And no one was ever there. I was, I had just bought that little hundred dollar drum set, like, you know, a few weeks before, no lessons, no anything. But when, Everyone was gone at that time. I, I left the last 10 minutes and I snuck on the school drum set and I would just jam. And then one day, unbeknownst to me, the band director was in there and he caught me. And I, you know, I know he's going to fire me because I'm drumming on the job, not drinking on the job, but I'm drumming on the job. He liked it though, huh? Well, no, he, he goes and gets somebody and says, wait right there. And then I come back and I think he's bringing my boss and he brings another guy. He goes, kid, do what you were doing a second ago. I'm like, well, play the drums like you were playing. So I played for a few minutes and they looked at each other and he goes, kid, you have some, you have the most natural talent I've ever heard as a drummer. Awesome. But I need you. I need you in the stage band, the jazz band, the swing choir, the marching band. What he doesn't know is that after that talent show from the fifth grade on every year, I tried to get in the school band program and every year I was turned down because they said we already have too many drummers. So from fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th, always turned away. Then he discovers me as the janitor at the school banging on the drums. The next semester, I'm in all the school bands and that's how it all starts. Well, it was, that's the, the patience and the persistence and then the, a, a, a unique situation. Do you remember the groove you were playing? Was it like cold sweat or something or what were you? Well, I know it was, uh, it was I was always doing something funky. It was just, uh, it, it was just, it was in me. And what's funny is even the first drum set I got didn't even have hi-hats. I didn't even know what hi-hats were. And yeah. I would become like a hi-hat freak later. But it was, it would, it would have been something funky along the lines of James Brown or there sure. was an O-Town tune called 25 Miles High that had this really funky you know, syncopated kind of beat. And those things were already in my head from the years of just, what I'd listen to as a fan. Yeah. And that's why later when I, uh, when I became friends with Barry Gordy and I did some things with the Motown folks, it was so special to me because all roads to me le led back to that. To Motown. Oh, I'm a, Motown. such a Motown fan. Oh my God. Yeah, I mean, it was just some of the greatest music ever. Z, Z I, and they, you know, I never would even begin to think what this is, is like, cause I haven't been in that situation, but did you ever, take it upon yourself to try to find your father and yeah, well there, there's a whole part to that story. Yeah. And, and, and that's why I've been working on the memoir for so long. Cause it's really a fairly incredible story. So, so, so father, it's, a, it's a happy ending or, or, well, I mean, uh, the, I don't know about happy, but there's a conclusion, yes. but basically, uh, so here's what's crazy. So my father abandons me when I'm six months few months before I graduate high school, you know, now I, during growing up, I had always sent letters to him through, through my grandmother, through his mother, uh, who, who I'd only met once. So I'd always sent letters, report cards, pictures. He never, ever responded ever. So I grew up with this total rejection over and over and over and over and over. Nothing I did was good enough to warrant a response. 
which is, you know, a deep wound that you really carry with you until you're dead. It's just part of your psyche. But it worked mm-hmm. in my advantage because it made me work harder. But ironically, I started getting the inkling to try to find him. And with my mother's help, we worked really hard for a few months and finally tracked him down. A few months before my graduation, I cold called him, surprised him out of nowhere, like surprise attack, and called him. It was a super awkward call. And then I told him I was playing the drums. Well, here's the here's the irony of all of it. He was a drummer, and he was a pretty badass drummer in the style of Buddy Rich. I mean, he could play all that Buddy Rich big band stuff. Wow. The first time I ever meet my father ever in my life is at my high school graduation. That is the night that I meet my father. And he he, comes so he decided house. to come. As a result of that first conversation of me tracking him down, as a result of that phone call, and then I was talking about music and drums, then he comes to the graduation. And that is where I meet him. Now, at the graduation ceremony, this is in Eugene, Oregon. I had only moved up to Eugene for my senior year. Immediately on day one, this is what I looked like on day one at uh, at a conservative all-white school in Eugene, Oregon. By then, I'd already readopted my South Central roots and who I was and my Black upbringing. I came in wearing an Afro. I had a boom box. They they didn't even see one. I had a boom box. I was cranking Michael Jackson, Earth, Wind & Fire. I had a fur coat on, platform boots, leather pants, and all kinds of jewelry. They hated me from day one. The jocks tried to kill me, tried to run me over. So you got to understand the first half of the year, I'm hated by the majority of the school, but I'm not backing down. I'm not (laughs) giving up who I am. This is me, and whether you like it or not. So midway through the year, I I get in some altercations with guys. I get in a big fight. I kick a guy's teeth in with my platform boots. I got to go see the principal. And uh, uh, then, then, so later in the year, I said, I, t- I told the principal, I said, Mr. Essig, I said, I don't think I'm going to make it through the, 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 the rest of the year unless something drastically changes. He goes, I don't think you will either. I said, but I've got an idea. I said, if you will allow me to I have an idea that I think might win them over. He was like, what's that? I said, I'm a musician. I said, I'm a creative artist, and they don't know that. And I said, I dress this way because this is my roots. This is who I am. I'm a music, musician. I said, would you allow me to put on a solo drum concert for the whole school? I said, I've got a PA system. I want to put on a concert for the school, just me, with my drums, playing along to tracks. and then Awesome. Doing- and so he allows me to do a solo drum concert towards the end of that year. It went from my the jocks hating me, trying to kill me, to after I played like Led Zeppelin rock and roll and Tom Petty and all the stuff I knew they would love and Highway to Hell. I picked songs that they loved, and then I did some that I loved. Yeah. And, and, but I knew I would win them over if I picked the music they loved. Afterwards, those guys that used to try to kill me were now defending me from anybody who would talk crud to me. Nice. And so it was really like a Hollywood movie. So, so the, what, what did you do for, uh, for the, like the Zeppelin song where there's a drum thrill solo at the end where you just pick the needle up and do your own ending or did you just play along with bottom? No, that I, I faded that out so I could do my own solo. Oh, nice. nice. And so at the very end of the uh, 40 minute concert, I did a little drum vignettes in between every few songs. I'd stop the song. I'd let the tape stop. And then I'd do like a few little things you know, kind of leading up to the big. But solo. you were forward first. thinking. I mean, you pitched this idea to the principal. He went for it. It changed your whole high school experience. It, it changed my whole life. It changed. It. And then, and then I could never even know at that time that my father was going to come to my graduation. Right. So here's the graduation ceremony. You know, they're calling everybody's name and I'm getting nervous because I'm going, yeah, I won most of the people over, but maybe what if there's some of the haters still out there? What if they heckle me? What if I get booed when my name gets called in front of my dad? This is the most pressure in my life ever. So it's a totally epic Hollywood movie moment because they call my name and I'm the only kid who gets a roaring standing ovation like like a Lord of the Rings, like hitting, hitting the bleachers. And this is my dad's first witness to seeing who his son is. He knows nothing about me. You nice. left me for dead. And afterwards, he meets the principal. And then he turns to me and he goes, wow, you're like the most popular kid in school. And, I'm th- I, and, I, and I said, well, maybe a few people like me. I never told him anything about what I'd went through, what I'd gone through. He didn't know anything about me. So anyway, these are all the things I've been working on writing the story for 10 years really 
pulling out the whole because it's really kind of a a Forrest Gump, Rocky, Rudy, Blindside kind of story, you know that that that, that let and yeah. so many so many things that happen that will make you laugh, that will make you cry, that are unbelievable. But I just look at it all with gratitude. It's just God had a plan for my life. Uh, no matter the enemy didn't want me to succeed, the world didn't want me to succeed. Drums evaded me for all of those years, even though I wanted to play. It yeah. was the same thing with writing. It was the same thing with speaking. There was always opposition to everything, every dream that God gave me, people that specifically tried to block you from progressing or, or succeeding. But I, I'd always kept my heart right, worked hard and trusted God that in time he would open the right doors. And I had a mother who had a lot of faith and prayed for me and filled my head with the idea that, that I could do anything. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a, been a heck of a journey, man. It's been it's, a, it's incredible. And I, and I could see Netflix, taking that on, man. I, I love it. I, I see that for you for sure, man. And I, and I love that you, I remember going to one of your clinics one time and you talked about seasons of life. It was a percussive arts mm-hmm. society thing. And, um, it really got me thinking. And it's, I almost feel like it, you have to be a man of a certain age to write your memoir. You know, there's a lot of guys that write their memoir at 40 years old. I'm like, no, you still got at least another 20 years for yeah. profound things to happen, you know, to you. But, uh, man, I just, I think it's a very inspiring journey. And now Jim has something to just kind of lighten the mood a little bit. It's our tradition. It's called the random question of the day. Okay. It's the random question. Random <laughs> Other day. All right, like here we go. We even have a tension bed. Zorro. <laughs> <clears throat> Would it be more frightening to discover that humans are the most advanced species in the universe, or that we are far from being the most advanced species in the universe? <laughs> The latter. <laughs> <laughs> if 2020 has taught us anything. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I kind of already feel that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> that was oh, easy. Kind of give me. That was easy. <laughs> hey, give I, him one more, Jim. Give him one more. All right. All right. All right. All right. You got to get the tension bed going. Yeah. <clears throat> what first world problem do you have? where do we start (laughs) (laughs) first one that comes to mind well the first world problem that i have is i think a problem that's fairly universal and and i think it's a problem that many of us struggle with and that is am i enough Mm. am i enough just being who i am that people would like me just for who I am, that I don't have to do a dog and pony show. Uh, am I worthy of being loved just for who I am if I accomplish nothing? Uh, because it, it's a question of uh, it's a question of self worth. And I think now that you know more about me, about the way I grew up, see, it would have been different if my father died, like in the war, than as a kid, or he just left and never returned, and there was no way to contact him. Then you just kind of have to accept that. But when you spend your whole childhood, every moment of it, thinking that maybe I'll do something and he'll respond, then that continuously sends wounds back to you that you are not good enough. Nothing about you is good enough to earn my love. So you spend most of your life doing things to earn people's love because you don't feel worthy enough to be loved just for who you are like that. And so that's, that's, I'm sure that's something, I mean, I've come a long way since then. And, and you were right about one thing uh, about many things, uh, Rich. And that is, yeah, you can write a memoir when you're 20 or 30 or 40, but you know, what do you know then? Right. You have to have enough distance to where you can now go back and really look objectively. And, mm-hmm. and now that I'm almost, you know, closer to 60, then I have a lens of a – now, I kept a diary from when I was 10 years old. So this wow. Is, I kept a di- – so I have entries in my memoir of my diary from when I'm 10, 12, 15. Wow. And some of them are absolutely hysterical, and some of them will break your heart. And none of them that I write to be funny or to be sad – it was just a kid writing how he felt. Now later you're looking at it as with a man's eyes and you go, Oh man, wow. Now I see what was happening. Like, you know, and so it's this beautiful thing, but 
And you can't be really, really, really honest until you're far enough from those things to where you can look back with different lens. And when you, when I see like a lot of these celebrities and they're in their thirties or forties and they have a memoir, it's like, you don't know anything yet. <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't, you haven't been through those seasons where you had everything, lost everything and had it again. You yeah. got to go through all kinds of stuff before you can really be vulnerable and honest. And when you're vulnerable and honest is when you're going to touch the most amount of people because it's going to come off authentic. Yeah. So I'm being very <laughs> vulnerable and honest with you in telling you that even after all these years, the, the question is, am I enough? Sure. Am I, am I worthy? I don't know if I fully believe it. I, I have grown in that area to where I don't work so hard to prove myself anymore. I have a certain level of confidence, confidence. A certain yeah. level of, but still there's that residue of sting. There's that residue of pain. There's that residue of, of rejection because really I grew up ethnically in a very bizarre way inside. I feel like I'm black because I grew up in a black culture. All my formative roots and all my formative relationships were all with my black friends in Compton. But I'm not black, I'm half Mexican, I'm half Irish. But I never felt Irish enough to be Irish. I wasn't accepted by them. I didn't feel Mexican enough to be accepted by Mexican because I didn't actually speak Spanish even though I was half Mexican. But don't so, they oh, both have the same color flags? Yeah, I like don't thereabouts? Know. I, I think yeah, they might. I can't remember. That's interesting. Look it up. But I this will. is what I have learned about, you know, we are we are culturally kind of wherever we grow up. Sure. And I've, I've said this to some of my black friends. I say, you know, if we all grew up in Russia from day one, even though you're black and I'm Mexican, we would be Russian. We would be Russian culturally. We may be ethnically something else where we came from, but culturally from where we grew up, we'd be more like what we are as a culture. You know, if we grew up in Ghana, Africa, we'd be African, even though I'm white or, or Mexican, right? So so half of us is is culturally where we grow up. The other part is DNA. And I never really identified with either forms of my DNA because although my mother tried to pass on her Mexican heritage to me, it didn't feel like mine because I didn't speak the language. I never went to Mexico when I was a kid. So it was just something she was telling me, but it didn't. Yeah. When I moved to Oregon, they hated me because my mother was Mexican. So I was not, I was, I was Mexican to them, but not Mexican to me or to the Mexicans. And so, so I had this identity crisis of like, I feel black inside. I got a black soul, but I've got these Irish roots that I know nothing about because that family didn't want anything to do with me. Then the Mexican people don't really, all my relatives in Mexico, I never were with any of them. I never grew up with oh. them. So yeah. what I realized was, then later in life, I met somebody who asked, you know, what's your what's your background? I said, oh, I'm half Irish and half Mexican. There's some other things thrown in there too, Italian and French, but most of those. And they would say, oh, that explains who you are. I'm like, what do you mean? I said, wow, you're so passionate about everything you do. Don't you know that like the Mexicans and the Irish, they will die for a cause. They are sure. fighting type of people. Yeah. And, I, and, and all of a sudden I realized no matter that I didn't, embrace those uh, ethnicities that I didn't really grow up with a strong leaning towards one of them or the other. They're in my DNA. Yeah. And, and, and my father was a drummer. I never spent a day with him in my life growing up. And yet I'm a drummer yet. So that's when I realized we are, all have ancestry. We all have roots, whether we knew them or not, doesn't matter. It's in our DNA. Yeah. And it's, it, cultural things are things you learn from what you observe, where you grow up. But DNA, like where you come from heritage-wise, these are strong traits that go from a generation. So then I realized that I got a little bit more interested in learning a little bit more about the Irish and Mexicans and like, dang, I am like that. Because the, the Irish are brash, man. And, and the Mexicans are fighters. And that's yeah. why I've been this way. And then the fact of how I grew up, you know. So yeah. all this to say that the answer to that question is, I'm not sure that I still believe I'm enough. That I, that I you know. I mean, I, I think a lot of creative people struggle with that because, uh, you know, we when we're aspiring to do something, we model ourselves after, after our heroes, our people that have already successfully navigated that thing so it's like oh i you know i i, I mean i really i love that gene krupa guy or I, I i really love that you know what i mean that carmine apathy guy and and then it's like you realize oh my after a while you become your own man and yeah. we're we're truly all like snowflakes i mean every snowflake that falls to the ground is completely unique so even without trying we are one all one of a kind which is oh. if we keep that in the back of our mind is is so special the other thing that i love about you z is that everybody can visit zorro the drummer.com you have always 
been an entrepreneur, you've always had a, a strong, you know, business acumen. You look at that website. I see myself in you as well because it's like, well, we could play on your record at a studio. We could do it at the house. We could do it in two cities. We've written these books. We can come speak for you. It's like offerings, you know, our God given talents. We are, we can offer to the world and as a result, we're never going to miss a meal, which right. is, I love that, you know? Well, and you, you have been fantastic at what you do and, and you're, you're an incredible drummer. Uh, you're you. an incredible businessman. You're, you're sharp, you're talented, you're, you're honing newer talents, newer dreams and desires. Sadly, if I were being 100% honest, which I will be, that there are people <laughs> that don't like either you or I oh, God. For, for those various reasons. Uh, and, and I find that very sad because I'm like, how can you dislike somebody who's worked so hard, who's tried so hard, who's given of themselves? What is there to dislike about that? There's a lot of people that want what successful people have, but they're unwilling to do what they did to get it. So instead, let's just bash them or let's just let's just envy them or bash them or say, oh, that guy is a self-promoter or this guy, you know, like, give me a freaking break. Yeah. Uh, would you say that about Nike? Would you say that about Apple? Every company in the world is a self-promoter. That's what business is. Yeah. Somehow, somehow it's nasty if you're doing it as a musician or as an artist or as an actor, as a model. That is how business is done. You promote what it is you do, the service that you provide. As long as you are genuine and you do the best work you can, you should be honored for that, not like put down for that. Yeah, I love But that. I have been in this business for 40-some years, and I've had so many – I won't name any names, but I've had so many um, secret enemies that are really – they pretend like they're your friends, yeah. But they're the, but they're the people who just keep watching your post. But they would never, they would never, they couldn't find it in themselves to put a like on there. What because, is it? Har because, harmless as wolves. Harmless as dove. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because to do that might lessen their light. And so yeah. I have a word for people like that. It's like oh. they're voyeurs. They're they're Instagram, Facebook voyeurs. They they always are monitoring what you're doing and either putting it down, but they can't find it within them to go. Great job, Rich. Great job, Z. Because yeah. they view you as either competitive or they're jealous. And I go, look, for me to hit like on Rich's page, which you know I do that all the time. You've seen it on of your course. Yeah. It's not going to take away any of my light. It's not, to, for me to say you're a, a kick-ass drummer and you're slamming and you're and you're doing great and I'm proud of what you're doing. You've known me because I've always been this way with you, sure. even when other cats haven't been. Yeah. And I go, how is that going to make – I mean, I'm only going to be as good as I am. However well I can play is how I can play at this day right now. So if I say you're great or you suck, is it going to change the way I play? Is it going to change how people think of my playing? Mm -hmm. So what what do I have to lose – by shining a light on you, does, does mine diminish somehow? Is my wattage out because I've given a light? No, I I will always be that guy hitting like on my fellow colleague, colleagues' pages, even if they never reciprocate. Now, I don't do it to get them to reciprocate. Yeah. I don't do it to, if I'm going to hit such and such page, so maybe he'll hit mine. I'm just genuinely going, badass, that was great. I love it. Congrats. Yeah. But, you know, but, I can tell you what percentage ever – respond i'll even say something really nice and there's cats that never not even a reply now, i'm talking about famous other drummers that everybody sure. knows and i go wow that says a lot about your heart that that says says it's more about them than you yeah but i, I but I, because i'm a tender-hearted dude that's always filled with love i just find it so heartbreaking i yeah. find it so disappointing that people can't champion other people hey if you hit it in acting and which i believe you will and you're pursuing this dream Dude, I'll be the first guy to go, awesome, man. You you did it. You found another passion, another dream you poured yourself into, and you morphed into something else. There's nothing – there's honor and hard work and hustle. As long as you're not screwing people over or cheating people or lying and killing people to get there, yeah. then, hey, if you get to the top of the mountain, I'm happy for you because I know how hard it is to get there. Yeah. I know how hard each one. I know how hard it is to write a book. I know how hard it is to be on a big gig. I know how hard it is to, to promote yourself and do it all. It's just nothing but work, man. I'd rather lay out on the beach and do nothing. But I have not found that I can progress in my life by doing that. So you know, take, for for, for, for this kind of a thing, you know, take what I'm about to say for whatever weight it carries. But you know, if you have haters, you're you're doing something right. You know, well, that's true. Happen. I mean, Jesus had a lot of haters. And he did. He I, sure I did. This is what's really crazy. 
I find that the more I let my light shine and the brighter I am in this world, the less and less friends I have and the less and less people I have that so would hit like. And by that, I don't mean, again, I'm not shopping for likes. I just, what, what, what you notice is this. This is what I notice with lots of other contemporaries or drummers is that they'll hit like on somebody else's page. Oh, I, eat a, I ate a pizza. I just got over diarrhea. They'll hit a like. I'll post something beautiful and inspiring to help people. Nothing. Crickets. Crick. Yeah. So what they don't understand is how obvious it looks by the mere absence of your, of your response that sings louder than anything you could possibly say of either hatred, jealousy, envy, it's one of those, yeah. you know, because they either don't like you or like something about you. They don't Hopefully like- it's not hatred. I mean, because there's a lot of envy and a lot of jealousy and, you know, Shakespeare talked about it all the time. And Jesus talked about it, but you know, I, yeah, that's it. But I, I, have got- felt, I have felt guys going, you know, why did you get to have an R and B drumming book or whatever? It's like, well, because I wrote it. Because I wrote the damn thing. <laughs> like 20 years, 30 years. I wrote I wrote it down as a goal when I was 19. I want to write a book about R&B drumming because that's the drumming that I liked and nobody knew anything about those guys. Yeah, yeah, and it was to honor other people. It just so happened that it exploded, that it became the number one drum book for a long time in the world. And then it got voted in Modern Drummer Reader's Poll. It's one of the top 20, 25 drum books of all time. Awesome. It's because, it's because I set out to do something that honored people. Now, I would have bought it if somebody else wrote it because it would be, frankly, lot easier every book i wrote is a book that i wished other people would have wrote and then i would have just bought it yeah but well yeah like i mean these i paid straight cash for these because i know how important it is to support the arts and to support an author and to support a creative you know i mean this is time and talent and blood and sweat and tears and so you wrote six books i mean at at least i think so i mean that's yeah and and the the biggest one is the memoir which hopefully will be out in the next couple of years but but yeah all that to say you know so my pet peeve is people who just can't find the wherewithal in them to celebrate each other like like you said we're all an individual snowflake zorro's drumming is a combination of everything i've heard in my life but I do play in my own unique way. I don't sound like any of my idols. I don't, I have influences from everybody, but in the end I had to embrace, okay, I have a quirky past. that's different than all these guys. I have a very tender heart, but yet I'm a warrior and I'm a fighter. I'm this mixture of, of all these cultural ethnicities and this strange background and a single immigrant mother. And this is how I play. And I play with conviction, no matter what I play, I play with all my heart and soul. I like a lot of different kinds of music. I play a lot of different kinds of music, but if you don't like my playing, that's totally fine. But I find, I love, celebrating all what all the other drummers do. And I have no problem in going, dude, that was so smoking. Like, I just, I just find it so sad that people can't be that way with each other. Uh, we can't celebrate each other because it, you know what it is. There's another quote. And it, I think it was Mark Twain. who said, when an envious man, when an envious man hears the praise of another, he feels himself injured. Yeah. When an envious man hears the praise of another, he feels himself injured. Yes. And that is an envious man. See, I'm not envious, so I can hear I can hear somebody praise you or I can hear somebody praise all my other colleagues and go, "Man, you know, how could you deny that you're 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 an amazing talent?" I mean, I, I would be an absolute moron to say, "Ah, oh, Rich is not all that or Rich is this or Rich is why? Rich is I've seen you play. You're amazing. Yeah. You've got an amazing energy. You've got an amazing heart. It comes out in your playing. You're determined. You're positive. You're focused. What can anybody argue about that? If you were a jackass and you were mean and you were self-centered and you belittled people and you and you were stepping on people to get there, then I might go, yeah, that guy's kind of a jackass. But you're none of those things. But you're none of those things. So why can't I celebrate you? And why can't I celebrate everyone else? But I do find that the lighter my – the lighter I shine, the brighter I am, the more God emanates from me, the less friends I find that can, can reciprocate that. And yeah. so in a way it's, it's lonelier because you go, I always tell my wife, how come I always have to take the high road? You know, I experienced, <laughs> that, I experienced that a lot, a lot of that in Nashville. There sure. were guys that I used to call before I moved to Nashville, or they used to call me every time I came to town, every time I came to town, they would, 
call me. Oh, I want to have coffee with me, have lunch with me. And of course I was, but then when you head. moved here, it was a different story, when right? I moved there. They stopped calling me. I'm like, you guys are the phoniest, fakest people yeah. I've ever met in my life. And yeah, I had lunch with you. Shame on you. <laughs> shame yeah, Jimmy, on you. We, that's how we, you we had, are. I didn't come there to get your gigs. I didn't want to play with any of those artists. I just right. moved there because God moved me there. But you don't mm -hmm. know that, but yeah. you're too busy worried about like your turn. And I was kind to many of those people, though they were never kind back to me. Yeah. I, I remember there was a, a drumming forum. <clears throat> you might have been there, but there was something at Belmont because I taught at Belmont. And a lot of the country drummers came in for some sort of round table thing. Yeah. And there were so many dudes there that, just it wouldn't even talk to me. So I broke the ice and I just went and introduced myself. They sure. knew who I was. Sure. You know what I mean? I knew who they were, but like I, I realized, oh, they're not going to say anything. Take we the high road. Two yeah. hours and they won't say anything unless I do. And I'm like, you guys are so full of crap. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, ce get, we get celebrate over, you, man. We, we, we get see over yourself. And I went and introduced myself and broke the ice and they realized, oh, he's a nice guy. They wanted not to like me. And it'd be easier to do that if you don't have to say anything to me. This is about human conduct. This is about kindness. This is about a generous heart and spirit. This has nothing to do with freaking drumming. But right. I was annoyed at that in the lack of maturity in people, that this is how you're going to operate. This is how you're going to live your life. And 90% yeah. of them would call themselves Christians, but yet you can't walk with any grace. You can't walk with any love. You can't walk with any kindness. You can't affirm another man who's, who's worked hard on his calling. Well, I'll do it. Yes. Even, and I have facilitated some dreams for some other drummers in Nashville. They had some dreams about people they wanted to meet that I knew. I facilitated the dreams for some sure. of those people, but have yet to hear from them. Or I might send them a text of something I was doing and never get a reply. Yeah. So I just go, Father, forgive them for they not know. Yeah, I just go, okay, do. dude, that's how you're going to die. I'm not going to die that way. No, exactly. I'm going to die. I'm going to die knowing that everywhere I went, I dished out love. I dished out grace. I dished out kindness and affirmation. And not just phoniness affirmation, but like a really affirmation. Real, yeah. Well, we said the drummer's good. I, I compliment you. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's and like giving compliments feels good, you know. Uh, and so we, you know, Jim and I know where that's why we started this podcast. We're coming up on a hundred episodes, and we like to shine a light and celebrate because everybody has such unique stories. And this ninety-minute conversation, someone's going to stumble upon this on YouTube, and they're going to have tremendous takeaways, and they're going to become a better person because of our conversation today. So I thank you, and to everybody listening, check out. Zorro the drummer dot com. And as always, we got an email address for you. For if you want to send us praise, you want to send Jim and I some compliments, we'll take them. It's the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. And of course, you can subscribe, share, rate, and review. Z, we had such a great time, man. Dude, uh, Rich and Jim, thank you guys so much for having me. It was a real honor. I'm just proud of what you guys are doing and and inspiring so many people with this and and just with your lives and with your vision and Man, I wish you nothing but great success and you're, you're awesome people. And I look forward to hooking up with you again in person. We always have such a great time whenever we hang. You I'd know, love that. Know. I'd love to see you in LA or Sacramento or Nashville. And hopefully this will be a great year and this, the numbers will reduce and we can feel safe again and go back to playing yeah. music. Yeah. It's I, I, you know, 2021, we could do this. Come on. <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to going here and some live music. Again. That's for sure. I was going to a lot of concerts before COVID hit. The last concert I went to, Steve Gadd invited me to see his band in um, in Oakland at Toshi's, and they were slamming. And yeah, that was the last nice. thing I saw, so at least it ended on a high note. Absolutely. Well, anyway, thanks for having me, you guys. God bless, and I wish you all the best. And thanks for just letting me share in my heart the good, bad, and the ugly, all of it. Well, you're making a difference in so many lives, and I love the speaking thing. I love all the books. Everybody check out ZorroTheDrummer.com. Thank you again, brother. And everybody keep coming back for the good stuff, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Z. This has been The Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com forward slash podcasts.